Yeah, so this talk is with me. I actually gave this talk already at ACCU conference this year. Can you all hear me in the audio? I just need to know how much I need to share. Uh, um, this volume, like, keep it up. Huh? Keep up the volume. Keep up the volume, okay. So yeah, I gave this talk already at ACCU in April, which is... Uh, and the reason we're doing it today is that we can record it, because they didn't record it. So that's the, uh, the unfortunate thing about that one. But luckily, I can reuse all the same jokes, so <laughs> yeah, it's actually going to work out pretty well. Um, so, to get started, a little bit about my background. It's basically two big uh, screens. Um, that was the first joke, you can laugh at it. Um, yeah, so I'm, my, uh, my background is from the KDE community. I started working on C++ and Q about 10 years ago uh, via KDE. And through that, I got into Q. Um, and I tried to ignore the build system for the first four years. And then eventually, uh, KDE started doing all this modernization. And we wanted to, to improve CMake so that we could get a bit of some hacks in KDE build system. So I started working on that. Um, and I spent about four or five years working on CMake so far, uh, designing and implementing stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and today I work in Havoc here in Dublin. Uh, I moved back to Dublin about 10 months ago uh, from Berlin, where I used to live. So what is CMake? It's a build system generator. So it doesn't build the code for you, but it'll generate a build system. Build system might mean make files, it might mean ninja files, or project IDs like Xcode or Visual Studio uh, solutions. Uh, it's built as being cross-platform, it's your cross-platform solution so that you don't have to write things specific to make files or specific to Visual Studio or Xcode. Um, it's part of a larger suite of tools for managing your build and even your CI. So there's C dash and C test and C pack for making packages, for testing your code and for uh, monitoring the, the health of your build. So it's still that's been around for a while, so I've this company Kitware in New York. Um, and it's an open source tool, so uh, lots of people contribute. Um, and I, I don't actually know how many people have contributed, but it's one of those things with a long tail, so there's a small number of people with a lot of contributions, and a lot of drive-by drive by contributions by people who make one or two commits, and then they leave. So this is just a plot of um, contributions over the last four years, and the big one at the bottom. Um, so, like, that's kind of the period where I was making a lot of this stuff. But I kind of stopped working on CMake about 10 months ago, coincidentally, the same uh, time frame as moving back to Dublin, because I'm resettling in here, so I'm not doing any CMake anymore at the moment. Uh, but you can see that other people have picked up, so. Sebastian doing a lot of work on the cute stuff, and uh, Daniel is doing a lot of repackaging stuff, and he's also just thinking about the future of CMake in the same way that um, I did for a while. So, the problem we want to solve is we have some code that we want to build, we want to build some libraries, we want to build some executables. Maybe we want to, want to build an executable which is going to generate code which we then build. Maybe we have external dependencies as well, some other program which generates some source code, some other libraries we want to link to. Um, and what I have in here is a, a dotted line showing what we want to build and everything else is sort of some archives and DLL. Um, so we want to build the stuff inside the dotted line, that's what you didn't see. You can use make files to build your code. I just tried to sort of categorize uh, different build system solutions with different uh, parameters here. With make files, you don't get a lot of abstraction. You basically write shell commands. You get some portability to Unixes, and you can use them on Windows, but you can't really use them very well with Visual Studio or Xcode. Um, whereas with those kind of IDEs, you do get a high level of, of, of abstraction. You get GUIs where you set settings, um, but you don't get a lot of portability uh, 
or flexibility, maintainability, maintainability can be difficult as well because these things tend to be XML files and uh, GIFs don't really make a lot of sense. It's kind of hard to treat them as code. Uh, whereas with CMake, it is code. Um, you can read the history of it in your source control system and actually make sense of it. Um, and of course, I'm very biased about all this. So. I think it's very portable, I think it's very abstract and extensible and very positive about it, you might have different opinions on this stuff. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of um, motivation for CMake to exist in the first place. And people tend to use it when they have requirements like finding external dependencies. It's good for that because um, it has this fine module system, which people have been using for a long time. Uh, people do use it for portability, for code generation as well. It kind of makes it easy to generate code, especially if you're using Qt. Uh, it's got a lot of built-in support for that. But it has support for the languages. So people have been starting to add support for modern languages these days. So um, C Sharp, you can build C Sharp code around CMake. So what is modern CMake? Um, because CMake has been around for a long time, about 17 years. Uh, it has changed over time in how we how we think about it should look like and whether it's declarative or not, and things like that. So CMake has a lot of old uh, legacy commands, say, in it, which are used a lot. But if you search the internet for CMake, you're going to find posts on the internet from like 2005 or, or 2007 even. Uh, which are recommending ways of writing CMake, which we wouldn't recommend today. We want to be writing less code, and we want to be writing cleaner and drier code. So, uh, modern CMake is built system laundry, clean and dry. Um, and it's more target focused. So, rather than being based on parameters of directories, and our source code is in those directories, so we build it a certain way. We say this is a target and that is a target, even if they're in the same directory, this one should use those include directories, this one should use those include directories. So, um, not forcing you to split up your code in a, on the file system in a particular way. And that has some other advantages. Now, I know you can't read this, but I will share the slides. Um, I'm just trying to make the point, and I'm going to zoom in to the early part of it. I'm just trying to make the point that most of what I'm discussing here has been in CMake for a long time. And you probably already have it, even on your Red Hat system, which is old, and your Debian system, which is old. And even on Travis, you can use this as well, even though you should probably install a newer version of CMake if you're using Travis. Um, I think most of what I'm talking about has been in CMake since CMake 3.1 or earlier. So, we can actually start looking at some CMake code now. Who of you have used CMake before and enjoyed it? Still a lot of hands up. Um, so a lot of you haven't, but half of you. Don't be afraid of this, we're going to go through it uh, chunk by chunk, not exactly line by line. Um, let's talk first about the very first line, CMake minimum required. That's, um, should be the first line, even before you write project in your CMake list file, uh, because it changes behavior of CMake. You might see things like this in source code that you find on the internet, setting CMake minimum required version to 2.8. Uh, we'll get into whether that's a good or bad idea, um, but what does it actually mean? Well, if somebody tries to use an older CMake, we're going to get a failure at runtime very early. It also sets this variable CMake minimum required version, which you can test later in your CMake code to find out um, whether you can use certain commands and features, for example. Uh, it also sets one-time behavior of CMake and policies, so we'll get into what policies are in this section. Um, policies are a deprecation mechanism for behavior of CMake. One of the principles of CMake is that if somebody downloads a new version of it, and they have an existing build system. You know, but if they can build their code with CMake, say 3.3, if they download CMake 3.4, it must still build that code. 
it must still generate a correct build um, But there's a problem there in that it limits flexibility. Uh, we do need to change behavior of things, we need to fix bugs, and we need to be able to do that without breaking the people's code. So this policy mechanism, this policy feature is a way of introducing new behavior without forcing you to use it. So if we share break compatibility on something, we make the new version of CMake use the old behavior by default and give you a warning about that. Um, and any time we break compatibility, it's usually fine range, so we can set policies for each individual change individually. <coughs> So I have a partial table here of policies and CMake versions that they were introduced in. If you say CMake minimum required version is 3.1, then all policies introduced then and earlier get set to the new behavior. Everything else is set to the warning behavior. Um, you can, if you want, still rely on an old CMake version, but request a new behavior from, from any of these policies. And you do that by checking to see if the policy exists, and then setting uh, the policy to new. If you really, really need to, uh, you are able to say, even with a new CMake version, I need the old behavior, uh, and don't give me a warning about it. And you do that by setting the policy to old. Now, uh, you almost never want to set a policy to old. It's almost always a bad idea, and it almost always is slower. So you not only want to do that in situations such as described here where there's suddenly a new version of CMake and suddenly it's giving you a new warning. Um, you don't want your users to see that warning because you're about to make a release. And you can't just uh, make larger code changes in your own code to satisfy the warning. So instead you just disable it. But you should only do so temporarily and you should definitely make a plan to remove such a policy setting. And just to illustrate the point about policies, um, what a policy does, or what happens when we introduce a policy, is that we keep an end the code which implements the old behavior. Pretty much for a minute, we keep it. And we also introduce new, new code for the new behavior. And if the policy state is warning, we execute both pieces of code, compare them, and if they're not equal, we give you a warning. So one of the policies that was introduced is policy 53. Uh, that was introduced because the parser within CMake, that parses the CMake language and variables, was made much faster. So this is not to scale, but the old parser is slow, the new one is fast, but by default, you're paying the price of both of those plus a warning. So if you want to set that policy to new, because it's very rare that you're actually going to get it. <coughs> so one of the things that you might do uh, with your policies is set a policy to old, but still use new APIs and behavior. So you know, using target include directories that was introduced in CMake 2.11, I think. But for some reason, I want to set that policy 3 to all. That's something you can do with it. Another slider thing you can do is set policies to new while still relying on an old enough CMake. So maybe um, your dependents are using Red Hat whatever, 6 or 7, and they have CMake 3.1, and you want to uh, update the policies so that people using Ubuntu, say, are getting uh, no disadvantage from that. You do that this way, set the policy to new for whatever list of policies you like. A caveat here is that some policies do not issue warnings. That's just because if they did, it would be far too noisy. So here's a list of them. Uh, again, you're unlikely to hit them, uh, but if you do, what will happen is you upgrade your CMake locally on your machine, and suddenly things break, and you don't know why. And so you run CMake again with this. Uh, policy warning option set and say I actually want warnings for this uh, policy 
and then you'll get the warnings and you'll see why it doesn't work. Um, yeah. Alright, so what I actually want to do in this talk is give some kind of gathered opinion and some kind of uh, guidelines for how to survive CMake. If you're going to start a new CMake project, if you're already a maintainer of an existing CMake project. So one of my guidelines that I want to give you is to, to maintain up-to-date policy settings. So, so far we have visited one line of code. Uh, so let's get deeper into this. Here again is the same slide that we saw before. We now understand the first line. Uh, the project command has a lot of options which are not shown here, but it just gives your project a name that will show up in your IDE, for example. And after that, I'm adding a library, and I'm using it in two executables, this salutation. And you can just use your imagination here. I'm not going to show any C++ code. I've got a hello executable, and I can buy an executable using the salutation library. Um, and what's nice is that I'm not repeating myself here with these executables. I say, I need to link to that thing. I'm not saying anything about how to compile uh, against the salutations headers. That just happens to work because they're in the same directory. But what if I want to rearrange my code, organize things a little bit, and make a libraries folder and an executables folder? Um, now what? What else do I have to do as a consequence? Uh, in non-modern CMake, uh, in my executables folder, I would have to say uh, include these lib salutation include directories in order to be able to compile these things. <coughs> I don't want to use the include directories command, I'm telling you now that that's the non-modern way to do it. An alternative way would be to use target include directories, which is a good modern command, but what I'm doing here is I'm using this salutation includes variable uh, for my dependency, which means I'm not tried, I'm repeating myself. So what I actually want is just that. I just want to move that code into the executables directly and something should somehow figure out how to compile against the salutation as needed. And you can do that as of CMake 211. You don't need to use that include directories command, you don't need to use any of those variables. Uh, but of course now we have to change the salutation to make that possible. So now communicate the usage requirements what you need to use in order to compile against and link against uh, that library. This is what modern CMake usually looks like. You'll have whatever targets you have, depending on whatever tar targets you specify, and you only specify them once. So it's very target-based. You're not saying, I don't know, much about directories. You're just saying, I need that target to figure everything out. So CMake will figure out the requirements in order for you to link against and compile against that library. And this is what you have to do to the loop salutation. All you have to do is say target include directories, and I say I need to uh, publicly uh, list the include directory in the same source here as I am now. And that means that anyone who consumes this target will list this include directory on the compile line because I've made it public. So uh, why did I make that public? Here I have some C++ code. I have my class that I, I inherit from through dependency. So anyone who uses my class is going to have to be able to find the through dependency header. Um, but the implementation of my class privately uses bar dependency. So you don't need the bar dependency headers in order to compile a use of my class. <coughs> so in this graph or scenario, um, foo is a public dependency of my lib, and bar is a private dependency, just because of the requirements of exe. So exe requires foo. Um, because it appears in the public interface of my So a lot of the commands that I'm going to talk to you now today about have 
options for public uh, specif specification, private specification, and interface. Uh, where you can now understand what public and private mean, and interface means you need to use this one, but I don't. So, um, that's something that you would use if you have nothing to build at all. So, for example, if you have a head only library, all of its uh, requirements will be interface only because you have a compiler. You have a compiler and a library. And we can come back to this piece of code and now just understand it. Uh, understand the public needs. Any questions there so far? So um, all of these commands, they accept lists of things. We can specify multiple times uh, what, um, what content we care about and what, in what scope. So we can specify the scope multiple times. Um, and that can be useful if you're building up something with, uh, with variables, for example. Not that you should do that, but you can. So just to labor the point a little bit about why you shouldn't use the include directories command anymore as of CMIC 2811, uh, we can explore a little bit what its behavior is. So here's the include directories command, and I have two libraries. Um, and I say that some dir is needed there. So when I compile the files within lib A and lib B, they will both use some dir. I think you could reason about that, because it's both. If it's in between them, what do you think is going to happen? Well, CMake has a sort of declarative history, so the behavior of this is that both libA and libB still use Sunder. And of course, it's the same if that command appears at the bottom. So CMake just has this legacy history long, long time ago where commands within a directory were attempted to. Uh, be declarative. But this kind of, you can shoot yourself in the foot with this because what's going to happen if I have a subdirectory in there? Um, I have gear one at the top, and is that affected by this include directory spell? No. The add library is, this is not. And this add subdirectory is, so this is going to get that include directory. Um, but it doesn't end there. There's an old CMake command, which is still available, it still doesn't warn if you use it, called subdirs. And if you use that, that does get affected by this include directory spell. So you're getting some, some messy stuff going on just because you're using old commands and directory based APIs. So you should try to avoid that. Another problem with using include directories and essentially not using target include directories, is you don't get transitivity. That's one of the major features of the target include directories command, um, that public interface stuff that I told you about. Without that, people populate these variables with lists of things and um, clumsy scoping uh, in order to sort of try to make up for that. So that I only have to have include directories app includes once, and all of those other targets in the other directories will kind of make use of that. So you might get clutter there, include directories that you don't actually want, but that could even cause problems in your book. <coughs> and it's not limited to include directories, there's also the add definitions command. Uh, you know, these were created before consistency was important. Uh, and it has all of the same problems. The same problems of ordering and of scope and transitivity. You know, it doesn't have transitivity. But there is a target compile definitions command which does, and which is target based, which has the scope and transitivity and the usage requirements. So anyone who uses lib citation in this scenario will get the use multi threading compiler and say, maybe that's an option in your build system. You can build this library with multi thread enabled or without, and maybe that changes API, uh, which is controlled by this preprocessor definition. And maybe it has an internal option for using SIMD or not. You can specify all that with the target include directories command. And it's more than just include directories and compile definitions too. 
the target compile options command allows you to specify compile options for a target from the compiler again, and link libraries as well, and even target sources. So uh, you can create a library, and put a source file in its interface so that uh, if somebody consumes that target, they will compile that source file into their own code. And you may have come across requirements like that in the past if you were building a system which included plugins, um, the static plugins or something like that. Maybe in your executable you uh, use these external symbols which are defined in your library just so that um, the stuff doesn't get described by the linker. So by using target sources, you can actually make that a lot easier. So there's my second guideline. Uh, write target-centric CMake code. Uh, get away from that old stuff, legacy stuff, and specify usage requirements on your, on your targets. The only thing that a consumer of your library should have to do is simply consume it. It should be fine. So another thing that you see in legacy or non-modern CMake code is a lot of variables. So here in this snippet, I have an app includes variable and an app libraries variable, say that gets populated or something, and then I use it in these directories. And maybe I use them like this. So app includes, app defines, app libraries, and these are just variables. But the problem is, if I do refactoring, or if I make typos, none of these variables expand to anything. So what CMake might see is just this. And you might look at your code and you say, well, it's using the variable. Uh, but CMake says that variable is empty, and so you build not might not work. Um, so that's just an inherent problem of variables. Uh, using a variable which is not defined is kosher CMake. It's no problem. Um, but it can cause you problems. So, uh, I would recommend not using variables so much. Even here, if you look at the add executable line in this, uh, in this slide, I have set main sources, and then at the end, I say add executable and use main sources. You see that a lot, and it's not necessary. Um, you can just list the sources in the add executable line, and you won't have this intermediate variable. So, variables are fragile, they leak. I didn't really say much about that, but um, here are these variables that I said are available, whether they're needed or not, in all of those subdirectories. Maybe that's a problem, or maybe it's bad. Um, they don't express any transitivity, or, uh, and they're not checked for correctness. So, you should try to avoid variables when you have. Guideline number three. So another thing that you're going to come across very quickly if you look up modern CMake is generator expressions. These are um, a language feature which can help you stop using variables so much. So some code which looks kind of reasonable, and maybe some of you were thinking this when I was saying don't use variables, is uh, having some condition where you extend that main sources list and then at the end you create your executable. Um, but it has this disadvantage that we're using a variable. So instead of using a variable, uh, we can use target sources and say, after it's defining that hello executable, we say, if it's Windows, add that source file as well, otherwise add, add this other one. And this is a step in the right direction, but it's not really dry enough. It's still more lines of code than I would like, and it's outside of the add executable. So what I can do instead is I can use a generator expression. And I know I haven't explained this language to you yet, but you can probably appreciate that I treat win32 variable as a boolean, and if it's true, I get help with win, and if it's not true, I get help with process. 
I am going to I am going to look. I am going to tell you a little bit more about generative expressions. So we'll see a little bit more about that. something else that you might see around, which is genuinely problematic, is using the CMake build type in an if expression. So the problem with this is it'll work with great files. And it'll work with your Ninja build system, but it won't work with IDE build systems because what CMake does is it will generate Visual Studio project and solution files, and then you open that, and then you decide whether you're going to build it in debugger release. CMake is already long gone, so any condition in CMake code is long irrelevant. Um, so if you have CMake build type being tested in an if command, um, you have non-portable code. But maybe that doesn't matter today. Um, but you should try to get into the habit of not doing that because someday you're going to want to build something on Visual Studio. And again, the solution is generator expressions. So we want to tell CMake explicitly to generate project files which have different context for the configuration, which is just a feature of those IDEs, it's that configuration macro in Visual Studio. And CMake knows about it. So I can say, if the configuration is debug, use this file, and if it's not debug, use that other file. Um, we don't have something like std conditional at the moment where you would be able to not repeat that condition, uh, but I think uh, that might be a nice extension someday. <coughs> so just to uh, put all of this in one slide, those if command of else and else if and and um, commands, they all operate at CMake configure time. The CMake has three stages of execution. At configure time, it's parsing the CMake list file and it's executing the commands within. And once it's done that for all the files, it computes the build system. It says this depends on that, that depends on this. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to build this stuff before that stuff. Um, going to link this to that. So that's the compute stage. And then the generate stage is when it's actually writing out the files. It's writing the make files or the project files. And the generator expressions get evaluated in around that, in the, in the compute stage and the generate stage. I think it might, there might be some of that class contamination, but the point is just that it's after configure time. So those things get evaluated, right? which can mean that they're difficult to debug and difficult to write, um, but yeah, you can get used to it, I hope. So a little bit about that syntax. It is a simple Boolean language. Uh, one colon anything expands to that anything. Zero colon anything expands to nothing. And so if we have other expressions which expand to either one or zero, can build up this syntax tree and evaluate whether to include particular content. So I've got the config debug generator expression inside of another generator expression. And if it's debug, then I get the thing, otherwise I get it. Excuse me? How deep can it go? How deep can it go? How many, How many levels can that go? Um, it's not constrained by anything except your system, I suppose, and CMake itself. So I haven't tried to exhaust it. If you want to exhaust it, you probably need to do some deeper repacking. Um, and you can use not just generator expressions. So here, you know, I put this concrete debug expression inside of this other one. I can also just put a CMake variable in there. Um, the variable will get replaced at the configure time, and then at generate time, uh, we'll get the generator expression evaluated. Um, which is why things like this one, why I can test Win32 and use this in that file. Generator expressions appear in, or are supported by lots of CMake commands now. Um, all of the target based commands, those kind of new modern ones that you use instead of the directly scoped ones, 
but also things for installing uh, your libraries and your headers. They can use generated expressions too. And you can generate a file, a file generate command, which has different content based on uh, whether it's for debug or not debug configuration, for example. So you will find those a lot in a lot of the CMake documentation. And you know, it is designed to try to defend you from pitfalls, just like a lot of modern C++ is. What we tried to do is design these APIs and recommend their use in order that if you do it that way, you're not going to be as uh, open to bugs. So in this slide, what I'm trying to do is get this uh, property with threads from that hello target. And if with threads is true, then set the use threads compile uh, definition. And maybe in some other part of the code, I actually set that property. <coughs> so what to look for is here I'm setting use threads, and here I'm feeding it. Uh, configure them. And I got the order wrong. And that might happen because these two pieces of code are in different directories, or because of some factoring or some merge, or anything that can happen. Um, and then I won't be using threads anymore, even though I should be. So, so what I can do instead is I can read it at generate time instead of reading it at configure time. So I'm reading this target property in a generator expression, but if it's true, then I set these threads. That means that no matter when I set the property, I'm setting it at configure time, and it's going to be read at generate time, which is by definition afterward. So that will hopefully eliminate a class of bugs, you know, that's the idea. So, there's a lot of conditions that you can put into those generator expressions. I showed you config, config debug, and now target property. There's other ones as well that you can use, like seeing if a policy was defined when a target was created, um, whether certain compile features are enabled, and what the location of the eventual binaries that you link um, are going to be. Because that isn't uh, fully specified at computer time. So there's another guideline. Use generate time config uh, conditions appropriately, or appropriately as appropriately. Um, and in particular, I put them into the interface of your libraries. So let's look a little bit more at uh, this target link libraries. This is appearing in a few slides so far already. And what it does is it expresses a dependency from one target to one or many other targets. Actually, zero or many other targets. Um, so we've seen this before as well. This is my original web salutation used by hello and goodbye. Um, the point that I made before was I don't have to spec any, specify anything about compilation. The include directories are correctly defined. The compile definitions are correctly defined. Um, and everything works well. The reason that works is that in that slide, lib salutation is a target. But this command, target link libraries, is it's also old, <laughs> and it has behavior which can also be surprising, unfortunately. So the content that you give it can be multiple different things. It can be a CMake target, and if it is, then we're going to consume the usage requirements from that. But it might also be a path on disk, even just a library name, and it can just be a linker value. So CMake does some tests on the content. Does it start with a dash? Uh, does it start with a drive letter or a slash? Things like that to try to determine what this content is, and should I try to find a target with that name? Um, <coughs> and if it does find a target, it consumes all of that good stuff, and everything will work well. If what you give it is not a target, either because you deliberately give it the name of a library or the path to a library, uh, 
it's going to cascade through these tests. Um, and maybe you just type out the target name, and that could be a bad thing. So, CMake will first check if it's a target that it knows about already, then it'll check if it's a link flag, check if it's a path, and check if it's. If not, then it'll just add dash L in front of it if the compiler is you know, GCC, um, and just assume that GCC is going to take care of that. But if it is a, a typo, um, and you actually want that to be a target, I'm going to show you how to handle that later. So you can build multiple different types of targets with CMake. Executables, different kinds of libraries, <coughs> shared libraries, static libraries, and object libraries. And I think if you're familiar with wake files, uh, I think they get called convenience libraries. They're just object files, uh, which you can do with what you wish. CMake then has these two special target types, the interface library and the alias library. So we can look at those there as well. The interface target is a target which doesn't build anything itself. It's purely uh, for interface specification. So you can say, if somebody uses this library, uh, the include path of boost.pl to the compiler, or uh, set these preprocessor flags, or use this compile option, multiplayer group, a CD, whatever it is. Um, and then a consumer of, so here I have add library, boost MPL, interface tag. So I'm saying this boost MPL target is an interface library. And then a consumer simply specifies that if their target is library is right, and consume all of the requirements that are specified by the lobby office. So Users of this target will probably never see this code. They'll just write that and it'll just work. There's something close to that. We'll see an improvement from that later. Um, and because these things are transitive, uh, well, the usage requirements are transitively propagated as well. So here I have the same boost MPL interface like me. But now I'm also defining an interface library for boost ICL, which uses boost MPL. So here I'm saying boost ICL depends on boost MPL. And maybe that has its own include directory, which is also needed. But the consumer doesn't even have to know that boost MPL exists. That's an implementation detail. All they need to know is they use boost ICL. So that, you know, the consumer doesn't have to traverse the graph and specify all the dependencies. Um, they always just need to specify the need. And in well-specified modern scenic build systems, that's going to be true regardless of the target types, regardless of the library types. It'll be true if what you're consuming is shared libraries, or static libraries, or in this case, interface libraries, or a mixture. Um, everything should just work. And this is all that the consumer has to do. That's, the, that's what we're going for with modern CMA. Um, so I don't know how, how deep I want to go into this, bit, but what I just wanted to express with this, uh, with this slide is that you can hide some of those conditions. So those generator expressions, they can get unwieldy, and you probably don't want your consumers to actually have to worry about it. You don't, have to, you don't want your consumers to have to care about whether they're on Windows or POSIX and should use this dependency or that one. Um, but you can use an interface library which contains all of the generator expressions, all of the mess, and then the consumer just needs to use platform specific. And they get Windows stuff and they get POSIX stuff um, without having to care. So, Maybe they've got some other dependencies as well. This one takes care of all that class platform specific stuff. And you can put that in the interface of your library, and they don't even have to know that it exists. <coughs> so that was interface targets. So we have alias targets as well. They define a new name for a target which is already defined. So here, a platform specific target. Find. And I say, I want a new name for that. Detail, colon, colon, 
platform for the consumer. And now consumers should use it with the new. Name. And this is what you would document. You would say, you know, use this name with the double go on it. The other target name is an implementation detail, nobody has to know it exists. But, and there's a policy for this, <laughs> um, CMake will treat a target name with a double, double colon, especially, if that policy is enabled. Um, I don't remember which number it is, but you can check that. And what it'll do is, if it finds content in the target link libraries command, which has a double colon, it'll say, this is definitely a target name. So if you typo, it's going to say, I can't find a target with that name. It's not going to assume it's a path on disk, or a library name on disk, um, or a linker flag. It'll just immediately give you an error saying, you made a mistake. Some of the alias targets are good for. Um, you can... Uh, you can go further with those and add an alias for every target in your build system um, so that you never use any target which doesn't have a double colon. Um, and there's definitely advantages to that, but it's more work. And, uh, I'll leave it up to you when you do that. It's not going to be a core guideline for me. <coughs> so this will work with any, any library. So in this case, I've specified a alias for boost NPL, boost called colonate NPL. Um, and the point of that is this should be treated as some kind of namespace. So if I had more boost libraries, I would put them all in the boost namespace um, just for consistency. Sometimes there's no obvious namespace to use. So for the for the PNG library, which C makes ships uh, a target for. We just call it PNG colon colon PNG because there wasn't any suitable namespace name for that. So that's just something to look at. <laughs> any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, you said that you're going to fight but not in the headers. So how can I limit that transitivity? So the, the my requirement has a public header that I want to yeah. do it privately. Right. So the question is, uh, how do I limit the transitivity when my library depends privately on another library? And the answer to that was a few slides back here. Um, Um, you would just use the private keyboard, keyword when you say target it like this. So that's the meaning of that keyword. Uh, it exists to express or to take away that transitivity. Does that answer the question? Well, yeah. Does the Nameless library have the same um, I'm publicness? Does an alias library have the same publicness? As the name of alias. Um, yeah, so that's the same scope. So, it was kind of like, other than just creating an alias. Uh, it has the same scope. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have any effect on the generated build system at all. So it's not going to show up in your Visual Studio solution or your make files. It's used only internally within CMake, and it does have the same scope. So if you define a target in a directory, um, and then define an alias for it, the alias will have the same scope as the alias target. Both will be visible. Excuse me? Both will then be visible. Both will then be visible. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a hiding mechanism, it's just another quality. Correct, it's not a hiding mechanism. Yeah. So, we can talk a little bit about dependencies, um, with the strengths of CMake, I suppose, especially if you're going to be providing libraries for the people to consume. Uh, and of course, the example that I'm going to use is Qt, because um, I wrote the CMake files for Qt back in Qt 5.0 um, to make it this easy 
two years queue. So this is modern CMake as of CMake 3.1, 2013 or 14. Um, and you can see all of the features that I've just been telling you about. It's almost dry. You know, I have to say find package Q5 widgets and then I use Q5 widgets. But I could be using Q5 going on widgets multiple times um, in that file. It's the same kind of repetition as we get in C++ and so we include vector and then use vector seven times. Um, so it's dry. I have the double colon, so I'm going to get an error if I make a typo. Um, all of the usage requirements in those things are consumed, and I'm only specifying leads. So if you know Qt, you know that there's also a Qt by GUI library and a Qt by core library. CMake knows about all of that. Um, uh, I don't have to know that. Well, at least I don't have to specify it. Uh, this is what we've been doing for. And it is also transitive. So if I have my own library in my build system, which depends on Qt, uh, I just say that it's it has a public dependency or Q5 widgets. So maybe I can say that it has a private dependency on Q5 network. Um, and then when hello uses local with, it will consume that as well as Q5 widgets and compile directly and link directly if it will work nicely. The way that people used to use Q, Q um, well, a long time ago, because the same pattern, this same pattern also works with Q4, because the Q4 support for CMake is in the CMake source tree, um, and we just modernized that. Uh, so even your old Q4 stuff will work just as simply with, uh, with these special target names. The way people used to do it was, well, use a lot of variables. So you used to have to say, add definitions and list all of the libraries that you're actually using for the score definitions. Each one of those would have at least one define in it, because that's what uh, Qt uses. Uh, each Qt library defines a symbol called Qt underscore library name underscore lib, and you want to you want to compile with that. So you need, you used to use add definitions to specify that. And then you would use include directories and specify the include directories. So you'd be, hopefully you would have the same list and it would not get out of sync. And uh, you would not put the wrong things in there and you would not typo and everything would be fine. Q5 also has this requirement of using PRC and position independent code. And that was in these CXX flags variables. So you have to have that messy line in there. Um, and then you define your local library and specify its dependencies here. And you would specify a variable as well for the public dependencies of local lib. So local lib libraries, when, when you finally use it, which I didn't even show here, um, hello would link against local lib libraries variable. And I mean, that's what? Three slides and it's incomplete. Um, so this is what we've been trying to move away from. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, but that's a general pattern, and it does persist in the package files that are available for other libraries. So with Qt, you can use the nice uh, target syntax. <coughs> uh, but with some other dependencies that you might have, you might have a find module which specifies variables. Then you would have to use those variables. The packages which CMake itself ships, they're gradually getting uh, those magical targets added to them uh, by contributors whenever somebody decides they want to attack uh, one, of those, one of those packages. And then what you will get is hopefully the documentation will tell you, and the release notes notes will tell you that you can just use through core from now on and you don't need to use those variables. 
So what this is, is called an imported target. Uh, this is the same kind of target that the queue uh, example, the queue slides we're using. Um, because those are not built by my build system, they're external, we want to import them into our build system. With what CMake calls an imported target. Uh, and I've just named it um, with these double semi double columns so that it builds. But you can compare that to these alias targets that I described before. Um, and just to see that it's the same. And the advantage of that is hello doesn't change under the pattern. So if I start out with foo being a library that I build and then use in the same build system. I would link to it with foo colon colon core, but then someday, in some other directory in my build system, I extract foo, I make it an external library, maybe put it in the package manager, and every developer will get new versions of it, do that, um, and then we have to find it. I don't have to change this code, uh, because I define a target when I create the CMake files with foo. So, do you try to use these imported targets for external dependencies? Um, I haven't gone into detail about what they really look like or how you define them, but I'm just assuming that you're using libraries which somebody else has already defined them. <coughs> but we can look a little bit about how you would create such files from your library, which does use CMake. So here I'm using commands which are new, at least in these slides, I'm using this install. After I've defined my library, I say I want to install it in an export set called EXP, and the archive is going to go to the so Different parts of different libraries go in different uh, locations. If, it's, if you're on Windows, the .lib file goes somewhere, the .dll goes somewhere else. Um, and you can specify all those things in this install command. Then I can also say, I want to be able to export, sorry, I want to install that export set, which I made here. Uh, and the files that get generated should get put in share slash cmake. And the targets show in the namespace NS code code. So what CMake is going to do with this line is it will generate those imported targets for you. And it's going to name them with this prefix. So it'll give you NS code colon pilot in your config file. And then we just have to say you know, install that config file and users will be able to use find package. You can find that file, find those important targets, and they can use NS code on my own. How do you feel about this? I don't think I installed, I um, explained it too deeply, but uh, I just want to give you. Sorry, but that NS also be added to your target if you use it yourself in your CMAC file. You have to also add an alias with that NS. So the question is. Will this NS uh, also be usable in the rest of this local build system, or will I have to have an alias target for that myself? Um, and yeah, you would have to have an alias for it yourself if you wanted that. So just after this, add library line, I would say add library NS colon colon my lib, alias my lib, and then use that everywhere. Um, yeah, you, so you have to be a bit explicit there. I just want to give you a taster for um, what it looks like if you're installing your own library. But I do recommend that you create those uh, config file packages if you're publishing and publicizing a library that you build yourself in CMake. Do not, you know, do not ship a findfoo.cmake file. Um, instead, you should take this approach and then ship the foo config.cmake file. Uh, 
uh, more uh, more usable to everybody. So that's pretty much it for my for my talk. As I had said before, you will find all the information about CMake on the internet, typically in the CMake wiki. Um, you know, it is supplanted by the CMake documentation these days since the CMake documentation system got improved a lot. Um, so you should use the documentation instead. CMake mailing list is very good. Um, Stack, L, Stack Overflow also tends to be very good um, on this uh, modern CMake stuff. You'll see me on there, um, Steve IRE. Uh, there's a question with an answer from somebody else which is marked correct, which is, and I also have an answer which is not marked correct. You can just ignore the other one, my one is correct. Because <laughs> <laughs> that has happened a few times. Stack Overflow has that issue. Um, and that is it for me. Um, thank you for attending. Thanks to the Dublin C++ meeting, meetup group for hosting and for Workday, oh, Workday for hosting. Um, and of course to the CMake maintainer, Grant King, who does most of the work in, um, in maintaining CMake for all those different platforms with assistance from Vader Robert often. And thanks also to Reddit. You know, people on Reddit gave me a lot of feedback when I was planning this talk back in back in February and March. That's mostly it for me. I have some bonus slides if you want them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Encore. Hmm? Encore. Encore. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> one of the issues that can come up if you're depending on a lot of different libraries is that those libraries can be incompatible. You could be using a library which requires that you do not use multi-threading and a library which requires that you do use multi-threading. If you use them together, things explode. Um, but it's possible to express that compatibility in your CMake build system. So here I've got a simple build system, looks innocent. Does anyone see the problem? Nobody sees the problem. So I have main, which uses Q5 widgets, and it also uses QJSON. What could possibly go wrong? The problem is QJSON depends on Q4, Q5 widgets depends on Q5 core, of course. And you can't link Q4 and Q5 in the same executable. Uh, it just won't work for all of the reasons that you can imagine. Um, so I want this to not be possible. I want CMake to tell me at CMake time, rather than maybe an hour into my build when something tries to compile, that I have to start all over again. <clears throat> and the way to do that is to specify some custom defined, so properties that I define customly, um, which have an interface prefix. So here I say interface cute major version of Q4 core is 4. And interface Q major version of Q5 core is 5. And I specify on both of those targets that the string in this interface has to be compatible. Right? So the, the compatible interface string is Q major version, which is defined here. And here, again, Q major version, which is defined here. And <coughs> If I try to use both of them together, CMake will see that incompatibility and it'll tell me exactly what's going on. So that's compatible interfaces. You can define things like that when you're creating your own libraries. The other thing, and this is just kind of a public service announcement, please lowercase your CMake commands. <laughs> Like, uh, you'll find a lot of CMake code where people use the shouty commands. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit irritating when you don't have to do it. Uh, it used to be the case that you did have to do it back in, I don't know, 2003 or something. Those things have to be uppercase, but um, that requirement was dropped, but the internet forgot. Um, so. Do lowercase here at CMake and just don't use those uppercase commands. So, if you have any other questions, I'm open to them. 
does the install command for creating packages allow you to put version numbers inside things, and then does the final package allow you to pick up individual version numbers of dependencies? Does the install command allow you to specify versions of things, and does the find package command allow you to specify a version that you want? Uh, yes. Let's see, let me remember how to do that. Um, I think, so I skipped over the project command earlier, but one of the things that you can specify that with that is the version of your project. And I think that might get picked up by the install command and it'll generate a full config version.cmake file. Um, otherwise, you can generate that file yourself. It's like four or five lines. And when you run find, find package, you can say, I need at least this version or exactly this version. So it has a few options for saying, I need that exactly, or I need that, or later. Yeah. Anything else? Well, then that's it for me. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so there are no more questions. Uh, yeah.